We always make sweet, so how about something dry? Today we make a dry traditional mead. And we're going to be using a honey that was gifted to us by Beverly, who happens to be a big friend of the channel. She gave us like three of these big jars of honey and one of her kombuchas, and that is what got us making kombucha in the first place. Now, Beverly has this really cool thing on her label. She says, no heat, no filtering, treatment-free, holistic beekeeping practices to keep the bees and you healthy. Now, that's really important. She takes care of her bees, like, to the ultimate level, and her honey is probably of a much higher quality than what you can buy in most stores and things like that. So that's why we wanted to try it. I mean, why not? And the recipe we're doing today is going to highlight the honey. It's all about the honey. If you've ever seen our My First Mead, this is going to seem pretty similar to you with a couple of different exceptions. But let's get started. What we want to do is get a gallon fermenter, and I'm going to put that on my scale. I'm gonna tear it out. Now we did not heat the honey first. So this is gonna be a little bit more difficult to pour than usual. It's gonna be very thick and it's gonna coat the inside of the funnel. But this water is slightly warm, feels maybe a little bit warmer than body temperature. So it'll take care of that. But So as Brian focuses, oh, we need to tear it out again. Yeah. Make sure to tear it out when you put your funnel on there. Yeah. As Brian focuses on that, I'm actually going to stand up and focus on the level in our funnel because it's not going to run as quickly as we may anticipate. Smell that. Oh, that's good honey. This is really rich, oh, yeah. really amazing honey. Should we make a brew with this or should we just eat this? <laughs> I really can't eat it, so we have to make a brew with it. Um, anyway, I am going to be using 2.5 pounds, and that's a little less than we normally use. And there's a good reason for that. Because of the yeast we're using, this puts it just below the tolerance level of that yeast, so therefore it will go dry, which that's the idea. All right, the moment of truth. Can you? You want it tilted? Yeah, tilt that slightly for me. Whoa, thick, super thick. I am watching. Now she's watching because it can overfill really easily. <laughs> Just want to get to the 2.5 pound mark. I'm at about one and a half now. And I'm filling up this funnel really quick. All right, so now we give this about five minutes to go through the funnel. Okay, while that goes into the fermenter, I'll give you um, a couple other of the ingredients that are going to go in this. But before we do that, let's take a closer look at that honey, shall we? Okay, back to those other ingredients. Two things, we are going to be using black tea. Now, it's important to use black tea, not herbal tea, not green tea, not purple tea, yellow tea, peach tea, whatever. Just use black tea. It's not there for flavor. You won't taste tea in this at all. Trust me, you won't taste the tea at all. So even if you don't like black tea, just use it. It's there for something called mouthfeel. It adds tannins because tea has tannins in it, and it gives that little bit of a pucker. It rounds out the flavors, because mead can be a little bit overly sweet if you don't do this. Even though this is gonna be dry, it could still be a little flat and boring. So, by adding a little bit of mouthfeel, we make it more interesting. The other thing I'm adding is orange peel. Now, if you don't have the type of orange peel that I have, it's okay, you can use fresh. We are actually using dried orange peel. How did I get dried orange peel, you might ask? Good question. I peeled some oranges, shredded them into little tiny pieces, and put it in a dehydrator. Actually, I think I used an oven because I don't think we had a dehydrator yet. That just shows you how long we've had this stuff. <laughs> and I let it go until it was pretty dry. Not like ash dry, but dry. And that's it. And I'm going to use a couple of pinches of this. If you don't have this, a couple of nice Good swaths, swaths, yeah, I just like that word, swaths of orange peel is good. Or if you want to use a zester, just use like maybe a quarter to a half of an orange. It's not really there for flavor so much as it adds a little acidity, it adds a little extra balance to the flavors of this meat. Okay, since our honey is just about there, I'm going to add in the tea which has been steeping for about five minutes. And it is just a regular black tea, nothing fancy. I mean, this one is actually kind of fancy. It's a Somme tea. It's actually a really nice tea. It was gifted to us by one of our moderators. It was Adam, I think. Yep. Now, as I'm pouring it in, 
I'm making sure to spread it all over the place so that it gets most of that honey off the funnel. And you're probably hearing all kinds of weird noises because the microphone is literally three inches away. T in. Okay, so I'm going to take this off of here because we no longer need the scale. It has done its duty. It is finished. And some people might get a little perplexed with us because they have in the past about exact volumes of water. And we'll get to that in a moment. So to get the uh, orange in there, really, really simple. Don't even need a funnel. Just going to grab a couple of pinches and feed them through. Nothing fancy. Brewing. Simplest hobby ever. You just have to have some patience, really. Three pinches. That's probably the equivalent of like a quarter to almost half an orange, okay? So don't overdo it or you will have an orange mead, which isn't a bad thing, but it won't be the same as this. So if you're using fresh, like I say, half, quarter to a half. Now water. We've had a few people ask this. How much water did you use? I used enough to fill it to a gallon, okay? So what we're going to do today, because we have this fancy schmancy pitcher that has numbers and a graph on the side, we can actually see how much we used. So let me get my funnel back out, which has now completely dissolved any honey that was left on there. See, convenient, huh? And I'm gonna put that back on here and get all those little bits in there. Get, get in, in. I said in, not out. All right, and I'm gonna start pouring some water in. How much? Well, I'll let you know when is enough. When you get to this far, you want to stop because you want to mix this up. If you fill it all the way to the top and then try to mix it, it's going to be a pain. So don't do it that way. Okay, to mix this, there's a few ways. You can get a spoon, put it in there. You can put get a drill with a thing on the end and go, you know, if you really want to. Or just put a bung in the top and shake the bejesus out of it. That's what I do. It's really, really simple. Now, being that I put hot tea in there and I put warm water in there, that honey should dissolve really nice and easy. What you want to do is dissolve it, but we're also doing something else. We're what else are we doing? We're creating aeration, which is important at this stage of fermentation. The yeast require a healthy amount of air in order to really get going on the fermentation process. That's why we shake it really crazy, because you can see all that foam that's being created that is the air being forced into the liquid. It's also a really good arm workout. Make sure the bottle is mostly dry and your hands are dry before you start. Otherwise it can slip and that could be bad. I have a rule of thumb when it comes to shaking and mixing. Do it as long as you think you need to. Then do it for two more minutes. You're probably just enough at that point. So you can go even longer if you want to. You cannot overdo this. But you notice the color difference? That's air being in there. It's totally mixed up. And I can see little bits and pieces of the orange zest floating around. But what I don't see is anything on the bottom. Now, when you're doing a sugar mixture, the trick is let it sit on the table for a minute or two and then look at the bottom. If you can see sugar on the bottom, it's not mixed. With honey, it's a little bit harder. You just have to make sure that there's none clinging anywhere. And it doesn't look like it. So I can remove the solid bung. Now, you don't have to use a solid bung. You can use the one with the hole in it. Just, it'll poke into your thumb. I call that my thumb saver bung because it doesn't have a hole. Now I need my funnel back. By the way, we didn't talk about this, but sanitization is very important. That is the first step. And we tend to use something called the red bucket of sanitization! Which is basically just a red bucket with star sand liquid in it. Now, not just star sand, star sand liquid, which means the mix. So it's got a few gallons of water in there. And everything gets dunked in there and soaked in there for a few minutes. That way they're sanitized. There's a difference between clean, sanitized, and sterilized. Sterilized is when it's like hospital clean, okay? We don't need to go that far. We just need to sanitize so that bugs that would normally try to infect this can't get in there or are dead. Now, I'm going to put more water in. How much? I'll let you know. That foam is a little bit of a prevention measure for me. It means I can't go as high as I want to.
And it's at this point that I decide how greedy I want to be. Now, when I say that, there's a reason. If I get too greedy and I put too much, if this starts to really get active, it can foam up right up through the top and spill out all over the place and I waste it. If I don't put in quite enough, well, that just means I didn't make enough mead. So at this point, you have some choices to make. This is when Derek always gives me the eye. <laughs> right now, we have a lot of foam in here. That foam is gonna go away because it's just air bubbles, okay? They, they will break up and go away. But I'm only to here on my level. I'd actually like it to be a little bit higher than that. So I pour really, really slowly because that way the water going in is actually breaking up the bubbles ever so slightly. And you see, I can get a little bit more water in there. I think that's about it. I might be able to get a little bit more if there was less foam, but with the foam, oh well, it is what it is. So now, because as we said, we are using our fancy schmancy pitcher, we can tell you exactly how much water we put in this one gallon, US one gallon fermenter. We started with 128 ounces. There are 40 ounces left, therefore we used 88 ounces of water. So for those of you playing at home, that is exactly what we used in this particular vessel. But if you're using a different fermentation vessel, then its parameters may be different, requiring you to put more or less water in it to get to that sweet point on your particular vessel. That's right. why normally we don't tell you exactly how much water we use. By the way, if you're doing this in, say, a two-gallon vessel, you would just multiply everything I've done by two. If you're doing this in a 1.4, you do it 1.4. If you're doing it in, say, a British gallon, which is five liters, you would multiply by a number that'll probably be here because I can't do that one in my head. I think it's like 1.25 or 1.3. So it's really easy. You just scale things up. The only thing you don't scale up is the next step, which is the yeast. Today, I chose to use Premier Classic Yeast by Red Star. Now, why this yeast? Well, because it was convenient. It was the first one that I picked up, actually the second one that I picked up, but it goes to 13% alcohol, and that's on the high end of where I really want this to be. This is probably only going to go to about 12%. That way I know this will go dry on purpose. I want it to go dry. For too long, people seem to think that going dry is a bad thing because most of our meads go sweet. Well, it, being dry isn't a bad thing. It was just not our preference. Things change, and we wanted to try something different. Now. Normally, I would use half packet of yeast to make one gallon. And I generally have a rule of half packet up to three gallons, and over three gallons, use a whole packet. At three gallons, well, do whichever way you want. But because there's not a lot of extras in here, meaning we didn't put any extra nutrients, there's no fruits, there's no anything in here, I'm going to give this the best chance I can. I'm going to give it a whole packet of yeast, as long as I can get it open. This is the only problem that I have with Red Star yeast, is their packets are plastic. And you can't just tear it. 71B, I can just tear the package open. One of the things that I like about this particular yeast is that it is meant for deep, rich, complex flavors in dry wines. So it's kind of tailor-made for this exact kind of brew. Don't get me wrong, mead is still really a wine when it comes to brewing, okay? Honey might not be as nutrient-rich as grapes, but it still is a wine in the way it's made, okay? It's, it's not a beer, and it's certainly not a hard liquor. So, you know, it's more like a wine. So I'm going to use a whole packet. When you get to the bottom of it, give it a good thwack. Get all those little yeasties out. They like to stick to the sides. I don't know why. Now, there is something we forgot to do, and that's okay. It just shows that we're human. Our new tactic has been, before adding the yeast, because we now dry pitch yeast, is that we would Ooh. take a hydrometer reading. Yeah, we can do that. Which we forgot to do. So we're going to do it right now. Um, can I mix it first? Sure. We're going to mix it, and then we're going to do it right now. <laughs> yeah, because there's all that yeast sitting on top. I'm afraid if I take a reading right this second, I'll just pick up all the yeast out of it, and it really won't, won't help. Now, because I dry pitch the yeast, it's, it doesn't matter if we do it before or after. It really doesn't make much difference. But a lot of people might ask, why didn't we hydrate the yeast? We used to all the time, and we found that there's almost no difference. Um, yeast comes pretty well active, and there's you know plenty of good living cells in there. We've never had a problem. It's just not a big deal. Um, some people say that it makes it start up faster. Most of our brews start up in an hour or two, so I can't imagine it being any faster or making that much difference coming any faster. If anyway. you have a yeast packet that you may have forgotten about for a really long time and are not quite 100% sure they're still alive, then 
pre-hydrating is, is a good idea because it will give you an indication of whether it's still going or not. If it starts foaming up in its little mini container, then that means, yay, they're good to go. If it doesn't, well, that doesn't necessarily mean they're dead. Just means that you might have a little slower time getting a colony formed. Yeah. Now, I'm going to take a hydrogen reading. For that, I use the Master Baster. This is actually sold for this purpose, by the way. It is not really just a super huge turkey baster. However, you could use it as a turkey baster, but once you do, please don't put it back in your brew. And second, I'm going to use a 100 mil graduated cylinder and a hydrometer. Hydrometer is just a density meter, okay? And it just measures the specific gravity of a liquid. What we're looking for is something in the 1075 to 1090 range. What I mean by that is 1.075 to 1.090. That is the estimated sweet spot for this particular brew. And I'm always a little hesitant to say that before I take the reading, just in case I screwed up. <laughs> now this is where I say, well, you know, honeys vary. <laughs> they do, okay? This was a totally raw, natural honey. I may not have a full, full gallon in here. So it's possible that that's why I'm off by four points. 1.094, okay? It's really not that far. It's not a big deal, but it is a little bit higher. And let me just make sure. I had a little foam there. Let me just make sure. Yeah, uh, actually 1.092. So I was off by two points. Um, I was actually shooting for a 1.088. I'll be totally honest. So I was off by four points. But let me take a note on that. By the way, taking notes is essential. You want to know what you did. That way, if you mess up, you don't do that again. And if you do something really, really good, you have a record so you can reproduce that again. Now, what am I going to do with this? I'm going to pour this right back in here. Some people don't do this. I'm not some people. You know why? Because everything here has been sanitized. It's clean. That was the silent mode. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. I don't think she's ever done that one before. Okay, so... What we have now is our must. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the cap back on. These plastic caps, if you can find ones that fit your bottle perfectly, we have two different kinds of fermenters and they fit one, they don't fit the other. If you can find them, they're great. The bungs will never pop out and airlocks still go right in and hold. It's a soft enough plastic. It makes a great seal. They're, I highly recommend them. We do have links to them in the description of this video. We have noticed that they seem to fit better on the carboys that you purchase straight off of Amazon. Yeah. And they don't fit quite so well on the carboys you may find with the free at your juice. store with the free apple juice. Yes. <laughs> now, what's the next step in this? We're going to wait until it starts fermenting and we're going to show you those signs once it does. So as you can tell, it is already bubbling. And if you remember the VIP, we've already shown you this because it was pretty much bubbling as soon as we put the airlock in it. Not five minutes. And we're just like, oh, that can't be a true bubbling, can it? Well, it's been going yeah. for like close to an hour now. Right. And <laughs> so, if you look down further into the vessel, you can see the little bits of yeast in there and they're doing what we call the lava lamp. And that's where they slowly churn around in the liquid. And that's another sign that something's going on because the liquid, even though if you remember this was warm, isn't going to be moving around that much with that little bit of temperature change. Right. So because we can see the movement due to the little particles of yeast, I'm going to say And I was just watching the working. foam right here. It built up and then released. And it's doing that, which means there's gases coming out that are trying to get through that foam layer. Yeah. We, so yeah, it's totally working. We can't see the little bit of bubbles coming up the side, but you do see kind of striations in the foam, mm -hmm. which makes me think that it is creating new bubbles and is creating those striations in the foam layer as new layers push up the old. So what are we going to do with this now? I'm going to let it sit. This is going to go for a few weeks, okay? There's been some confusion as to how long this should take and what to do. Well. I probably won't do a whole lot with it. In the first few days, I might give it a swirl. What I mean by that is just this. Just a little bit. And it breaks up some of that stuff. But see, this went backwards. Got to be careful. Sometimes when you do that, you can make a, a vacuum in there. And it actually will suck the pressure back in. I pulled the airlock out because it was pulling the sanitizer liquid in. That's not really a problem. But I didn't want all of it in there. 
the swirl once a day, twice a day if you really want to, for like three to five days, a week if you really want to. Beyond that, don't do it. Let it sit. Yeah. Don't touch it. You don't have to do the swirl, okay? It's not absolutely a necessity. All it does is it helps keep things moving. It can help a slow fermentation a little bit, but it's not the end of the world. It's not even, it probably doesn't even make a 10% difference in your brew, I'll be honest. Something that is crucial is you want to keep it out of direct sunlight. So yeah. we have our fermentation station, which is closed off from sunlight. And also temperature. We keep ours between 70 and 75 degrees. Actually, it's probably closer to 72 to 76 degrees. That's Fahrenheit, by the way. Don't do that at Celsius. That would be very bad for your brew. Can you do it at higher temperature? Mm, yeah, but it could create some off flavors. Can you do it at lower temperature? Yeah, but it'll probably be slower and has more propensity to stall. So you have to be careful. Some yeasts are more active in those ranges, and that might be a good yeast for you to use. Now, for this exact mead, do we have to use the yeast we used? No, you can use pretty much anything that has over a 12% tolerance, which is about, oh, I don't know, 95% of the yeast for wine and mead out there. Can you use bread yeast for this? Absolutely, if you want to. It might come out mildly sweet, it might go dry. Not really sure because it usually, in our case, goes to about 11.8, which this, by my calculation, should be about 12.4%. So you might get a little bit of a sweet taste if you used bread yeast for this. We do have viewers in colder climates that have said they have little sweaters for their carboys yeah. or wrap them in blankets, and that helps keep the temperature at a more stable level. And in warmer climates, leave it in a, a container of water, just like a tub with some water on it. Take a towel, soak it in water, wrap it around it, couple times a day, change that out, ring it out, and that'll drop the temperature a bit too. So there's ways to maintain all that stuff. But the main rule about brewing is this. Time heals all brews, and mead wants to make itself. We just need to learn to stay the heck out of the way. That's really the main thing to it. By the way, if you like this video, look up. There'll be another one up there. You might like that one too.